Let me start. So um, welcome everyone um, to the um, fifth uh, educational lecture. And um, today we're very fortunate to have um, Dan um, Flinkery from um, the Genelia uh, Research Campus um, to speak about um, two photon mass scope development and design. Um, quick introduction to Dan. Um, Dan received a um, Bachelor of Science degree in physics from Stanford and a master's uh, degree in physics in um, instrumentation from Stony Brooks University. After that, uh, he worked as an instrumentation engineer in uh, Karen Savoda's lab in Cold Spring Harbor. And when Karen moved to um, Genelia um, in 2006, then joined um, JET, um, which is uh, or Genelia Instrumentation uh, Design and Fabrication Department, and now known as JET. And within Karen's lab at Genelia, then designed and built um, a microscope system for neuroscience research and has specialized in designing uh, microscope lenses. I think this is a very topical um, um, sort of optical um, talk that I'm very much looking forward to, um, to hearing how he's developed this um, um, really impressive uh, uh, instrument. Right, Dan, take it away. Okay. Um... Thanks, Steve, for the introduction. Um, so yes, I'm going to be talking about um, uh, the development of this uh, microscope. Um, generally avoid trying to give talks. Uh, clearly, I kind of failed this time, um, uh, especially when you're supposed to have some educational component. Um, so I, I had, you know, some 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 old slides that describe the the, the microscope. Uh, it was developed a little while ago now. And, 2015 to 2016, um, and uh, you know, uh, that stuff is all good. <laughs> Hopefully, the educational stuff is not not too rough and is somewhat useful to, to someone. And hopefully, it also it doesn't take over the whole talk. I'll, I'll maybe start skipping it if, if that if that uh, that starts to be the case. Um, um, well, uh, here we go. Uh, uh, also asked to talk a little bit about um, the department I'm in, uh, JET, uh, right now it's, it's uh, Genelia Experimental Technology uh, is what it's called. And it's, and it's a department within Genelia that is uh, uh, comprised of engineers, technicians, um, and machinists. Um, and uh, we are kind of a permanent staff at Genelia. Um, that are available to researchers at Genelia to design and fabricate research instrumentation. Um, uh, and uh, let's see, yeah, we have about 17, 15 to 17 people in the department right now. And, uh, and um, we do electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, uh, a little bit of software, optical engineering, um, um, you know, lens design which is my specialty within the department. And um, uh, that's, um, let's see. So, uh, yeah, so I'm an engineer. Um, uh, you know, in Jet, uh, we we do um, you know large projects, small projects. You know, from very small to very large. This is kind of one of the, the larger projects um, that that people in my department do. Uh, like I said, it took about um, two years from kind of beginning of development to through to kind of the end stages, uh, which is kind of a workshop that we did, I'll talk about later, and commercialization. Um, and um, so mostly I'm gonna be talking about the engineering and not, not science, you know, the, the little bit of science, you know, is, is, is I'll talk about as little as possible here at the beginning, uh, just motivation for, for, for why, you know, what, what, you know, what's the basic data that the, the microscope's collecting and, and why. Um, you know, here is a, a video of, um, uh, a bit of mouse brain, um, the, you see neurons that are expressing a genetically encoded calcium indicator, uh, which is a protein that, uh, you know, when there's more calcium in the cell, it gets brighter, and more calcium goes in the cell when it has a lot of action potentials. That's all the neuroscience right there uh, that I'm going to talk about. And um, so, uh, you know, you can see, you know, optically, um, kind of a correlate of, of neural activity. And, you know, it doesn't take a lot to convince somebody that this is, you know, interesting data. You can learn a lot about how brains work by kind of taking these, these sort of uh, movies. 
Um, so this is you know, what, what we're looking at with the microscope. Um, um, this is uh, a patch of the brain that's, that's here, 600 by 600 micron. My cursor going. And uh, I can see that's you know, a pretty small part of the mouse brain. Um, of course, neurons uh, communicate with each other across the whole brain you know, pretty quickly. You know, there's computations you know, spanning the entire brain. Um, so you, know, you just want to be able to get data from as large an area as possible. Um, so you know, the microscopes that you can buy can kind of get data that looks like this um, from an area that's a little bigger than, than what we're seeing here about a millimeter um, in diameter. Um, but you know, we, we had a goal with, with, with this project to, to, to go bigger and you know, about five millimeters is what we're trying to do. So we can get a large chunk of, of one hemisphere of the mouse brain with, with uh, a few different cortical regions that kind of do different um, interesting things. Um, so now, you know, uh, a lot of the educational component will be, you know, what, why is that difficult? Why you know can't you do that easily? And why does it require you know what we did, kind of designing the entire microscope, and all the optics from scratch? And um, uh, so you know, have a, you know a couple little uh, cartoons, and you know then uh, a slide later with, with, with a bunch of stuff. We'll see. Um, so you know, if, if you try to buy an objective from a microscope company, you'll, you'll always find. Uh, more or less, that uh, you know, if you increase the field of view, you decrease the numerical aperture. And uh, you know, going back to very basics, uh, the numerical aperture is uh, you know, the, the, the angular extent of the cone of light rays that you know, either is being emitted from a spot that's being collected by the by the microscope system, or uh, in this case, this is a two-photon microscope um, is, is being. Sent from the microscope to a spot to excite the fluorophore at, at, at a single spot. Um, I was told I didn't have to, to talk about you know, the basics of two photon microscopy that was covered in a previous uh, talk in the lecture series. So, this is uh, motivation for, for watching every uh, talk in the series, I guess. Um, so, uh, so, we'll assume you know a little bit about two photon microscopy. You know, we, we are um, sending light down to excite uh, a small spot in the brain and then collecting fluorescence. Uh, from, from that spot and, and um, uh, you know, the, the resolvable, you know, the resolving power of our microscope depends on how small of a spot um, we can excite at a time. And you know, that, that unit is kind of, uh, is called the point spread function basically. So, so um, and, and that's kind of the smallest uh, unit we can, we can image at a time and, 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 and gives us the resolving power of our microscope. Um, so let's see, as the uh, numerical aperture gets larger, the point spread function gets smaller. Um, this is uh, something that I, that I won't develop more, but I think it's pretty, pretty well known. Um, and here's kind of a you know, visual comparison of the point spread function size, you know, more or less to scale uh, of a few different um, numerical apertures here from 0.2 all the way to 0.6. Um, at 0.6, we have a point spread function that's you know, the lateral size here is the first number, um, uh, and here we go. And the the axial extent that's that's how big it is um, in the direction of the, the light propagation. It's the second number here. Here's the size of our of our point spread function at a, a numerical aperture of 0.6, and uh, at a numerical aperture of uh, 0.2, we have a much larger point spread function that. Um, the overlay uh, about how large a, a neuron is. This is kind of a typical neuron, I believe, in the cortex of a mouse. Um, and you know, we want to resolve one neuron from another, so we can see you know, video like this. Um, you know, we need basically, you know, we need to have a large enough numerical aperture in order to do that. Um, maybe more. Well. Um, Uh, there's you know, further problems with, with decreasing the numerical aperture uh, in, a, in a microscope and as the signal gets a lot uh, more dim. Um, I think that's all I'll say about that because it's going to grow um, at this rate. Um, uh, 
also the as you decrease the numerical aperture, the, the collection um, uh, gets uh, worse because uh, emitted uh, photons that are emitted from the the, the fluorescence that you cite um, um, can go in any direction, and the probability of them being uh, collected. Um, um, you know, it gets higher as the numerical aperture gets higher. Uh, um, so, so anyway, I think I've thoroughly, <laughs> hopefully, um, got, got, got over the many, many reasons why uh, a lower numerical aperture uh, will not work for, for taking this kind of data. Um, the signal is, is you know, both the signal that's produced is small, the signal that's co collected is too small, and uh, the resolution is too bad, um, as it's too large to, to, to resolve cells from each other. Um, so, you know, you need the situation where you have a large field of view and a large numerical aperture, and why uh, is that difficult? Um, okay. Um, so, uh, <laughs> take a step backwards. Um, you know, what does an optical system do? Here I have, uh, you know, just a, uh, an illustration is taken from from a, a lens design class um, from uh, this is from Jose Sassian at the University of Arizona. Um, I just uh, used a couple uh, images from him. Um, so, so we have basically what here a spherical wavefront, and we have an optical system in the middle. I could have drawn a box here showing an optical system. Um, and what, what we want to do is we want to take a spherical wavefront over here. And transform it into a spherical wavefront on the output side, so that we take, you know, uh, information that comes from a single point here and uh, image it onto a single point over here. Here we have object space, and here we have image space. Um, um, what I what I wanted to you know, illustrate here is, is that an optical system um, operates on on kind of a, a four dimensional object. And, and and what do I mean by that? So so here at this point in space. We have rays can come out in any direction, or alternately, you could say, you know, I have a spherical wave front, and, the, and, the, and the, that spherical wave front, you know, has some extent. Um, and and to describe any, you know, little piece of light that's coming out of out of this one point, um, we we need kind of a four-dimensional uh, entity, and 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 those dimensions are you know, the the position of the the point source in the the Object space here is the h vector, with the, you, know, you can say the x y coordinate of the the, the the point source, and and also we have the direction that the light is coming out, or kind of the position on this wave front where it is, which is usually kind of uh, called like a, a pupil vector, and you can parameterize that in different ways. You can say kind of a, a position if your pupil plane, which is somewhere in the middle of this optical space. Or you could, um, here I have it characterized as, as kind of two angles, you know, an angle in one direction and an angle in another direction. Um, and, and so, you know, your, your optical system has to operate on, 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 on light, you know, like a little piece of light, or you could call it a light ray that, that com comes from anywhere within, within this, this kind of four dimensionally bounded space. Um, now, you know, so, so I want to do this to introduce Etandu, which um, um, I had a whole other way to, way to do it before, but I, I tried to make it shorter, and making it shorter made it kind of incomprehensible in, in some ways. Um, and again, see, I always end up with you know something that either somebody knows what I'm talking about and it's boring, or somebody doesn't know and they're not going to learn it, and and it's just always so frustrating to me. Um, um, but uh, but. You know, like, like you know, if you had a kind of a, a 3D collection of points, and you wanted to say what's the volume of that, you know, you have a solid that's made up of points. You'd say what's the volume of that solid. Um, Etandu is kind of like a, a volume of light rays, um, or um, and that's why I don't yeah, better better you know verbiage to describe it for an optical system. Um, but you know what what it is is basically um, you know. And most places in an optical system is kind of hard to calculate. And that's kind of like, you know, if you have a solid that's kind of lumpy and, and, and oddly shaped, but, but you, know, you can also have a solid that's a cube where, where in every dimension it you know, has the same extent. Um, um, and then if you flip the dimension again, you know, it has the same extent in that dimension. And 
and that, that's similar for an optical system um, at the uh, at the object plane or also at the pupil plane. Things get very simple. At the object plane, you have you know a, a collection of points, and they all emit a light um, with, with the same cone angle um, or the same numerical aperture. And there, it's easy to, to calculate the et and, and in this case, it's you know, just kind of the solid angle subtended by by the, you know, the, the, the cone of light that's collected by the optical system times s, which is the, the area of the uh, field of view. And, and the solid angle is it's also equal to pi times numerical aperture squared. So this is um, you know, the et hondu um, that you're operating with, with the optical system. Now, um, you can see here that et hondu uh, goes up uh, as the quantity that we want to increase here, which is the, the field of view, which, is, which, in, which in our case is s, the area of the field of view and the numerical aperture. Um, so re really what we're saying is, is that we want a higher et hondu microscope system than, than what is co commercially available. Um, so let's see, another interesting thing we could say about the et hondu um, uh, is you know, quickly seen, uh, maybe it's, uh, almost obvious, but, but, uh, but um, I'll put this here anyway. Um, um, you know, say we have D, this is you know, the, the resolvable distance in a microscope. And this, there's different ways to define this. Here, it's, it's the Abbey resolution, a uh, very classic, very famous way um, um, to define the, the resolving power of a microscope. And it's just a wavelength of light divided by two times the numerical aperture of the microscope. And um, so we could, we could ask, you know, what's the number of resolvable elements that uh, the microscope system can transmit? And that's going to be proportional to, you know, the area of the field of view divided by um, the area of kind of a resolvable patch uh, in the, the field of view, which is going to go like uh, d squared here. And we see that that's proportional to the et hondu. So basically, the et hondu is proportional to um, the amount of information that can go through uh, the optical system, or you know, uh, again, the number of uh, different resolvable points within the field of view. Um, so um, that's you know, the very basics about Etondu. Um, and at this point, I wanted to talk a little bit about you know, what an optical system is and what aberrations are, uh, because that, that, that'll lead to um, the conclusion of you know, why it's difficult to you know, just increase that, the head on you. Um, so, so, you know, so, so, so the, the first thing I want to say is you know, basically what are aberrations? So um, as I said here, your, your optical system, we want to take a spherical wavefront here and turn it into a spherical wavefront here uh, on the output, from the input to the output. And um, except under very um, um, special circumstances that, that aren't really uh, that useful, you know, any optical surface you can use, spherical, aspherical, whatever, you know, will not do this right. Um, um, they're, they're, it's going to uh, create aberrations. What are aberrations? Aberrations are just one way to think about them is, is in a new, you know, is if you just enumerate every possible way that uh, this transformation can go wrong. So here's um, uh, the, the fourth order aberrations, and, and what we're seeing here. Uh, and this is in the pupil plane. Um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't really developed, but um, um, you know, if, if, if you say, you know, if you want this to be a sphere and it's not quite a sphere, what's the difference between the spherical wavefront, which is going to, you know, form a perfect image here, um, or an aberration limited image here, uh, or a diffraction limited image, I should say, <laughs> here, um, and you know, the actual wavefront that you're that your optical system produces, um, the difference between those two things is the aberration. And, uh, and here's the shape of a few different aberrations. And, and what we see here, this is the, the magnitude of the aberration. And you know, what's, uh, what's cool to see, and what, what you know, I first learned in, in lens design, um, of course, the that I took is that you know, the aberrations are just, just every possible um, way to make a scalar function out of uh, our, our, our four-dimensional variables that are going into it here, here which are two um, vectors. Um, you, you know, we need a scalar output from from these vectors, so um, we have to take uh, dot products of the vectors, and every possible way we can make take dot products of these vectors that gives us um, our, our fourth-order aberrations here. And as we start adding more and more powers, it gives us higher-order aberrations. So 
So here we have sphere collaboration, here we have coma, here we have astigmatism, here we have uh, field curvature, here we have distortion, here we have this is a non imaging aberration, this is uh, field dependent piston. Um, well, but basically, you know, aberration, you know, every uh, the point is just that, you know, every optical system has aberration. Um, and, uh, you know, what an optical quasi is. So the next, the next point to make is, 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 is that, you know, basically all aberrations are all used there to some extent. Um, and, and you can say, you know, there are large aberrations. You can separate them basically into large aberrations and small aberrations. Our large aberrations you have to care about. Those are the ones that, that uh, make your imaging system uh, uh, not diffraction limited anymore. Um, and you know, if you get rid of those aberrations, the, the imaging gets better. And there are aberrations that are small, which is you know they're uh, uh, they, they don't contribute to to a detriment in the image. And and, um, and you know there, there's very natural length scale there, and that is the wavelength of light. So if the aberration, you know, so that and and by when I say when I when I kind of reduce it to one number, I mean kind of the the maximum extent of the aberration at the edge of the field, you know, both in uh, pupil and and in, in field space, um, if the extent of the aberration is much larger than um, the the wavelength of light. Then you know, it's a bad aberration; it's large. And if the the extent of the aberration is much smaller than the wavelength of light, then it's small, and it doesn't matter. So so you know, viewed in this way, all optical design is basically um, you know finding an arrangement of lenses which will make the you know. All of the aberrations that you can get small, and um, you know, so every lens uh, in an optical system uh, will produce different amounts of different aberrations, and uh, it's basically just kind of solving a, a large, um, um, like a large um, linear algebra problem, figuring out which combination of lenses will will, will result in all of the aberrations adding up to to zero or as close as you can get. Um, so that's what. You know, lens design basically is. Um, now, on top of that, um, every aberration uh, gets larger as the eton do increases, and some of them get larger uh, as the, the NA increases. Some of them gets larger as the field increases. Most of them get larger as both increase with, with varying powers. So, as the eton do increases, um, um, the uh, and another thing is that. Um, you know, for low aton do the low order aberrations dominate, and, you, and the high order aberrations um, are just naturally very small. So, and that's you know, really how you kind of define kind of a low aberration or a low aton do optical system is you know you only have to worry about low order aberrations, and only a few lenses are necessary in order to drive all the aberrations down to zero. Um, and a high aton do optical system, you know, the, the higher order aberrations get larger. Um, and you need to you need more and more degrees of freedom. You need more and more lens surfaces in order to um, have the degrees of freedom to, to, to drive all the aberrations down to, to you know, a level which will, which will um, give you diffraction limited imaging. Um, so uh, all that said, um, if you look at you know some actual numbers. Um, so you, you know, Basic idea of, of how much we're trying to increase that on do um, with this sort of mesoscope system. So here is uh, the Nikon, let's see, 16x um, objective um, that is used a lot um, in neuroscience. Um, it has about 1.25 millimeter field of view, 0.8 uh, numerical aperture. Um, <clears throat> Um, here's the approximate eton do. It's in units of, of area because um, uh, you know angle is unitless. Um, here's uh, this is in the Abbey uh, um, uh, resolution. This is resolution when it's used in, in two photon microscopy about. And here's um, uh, you know you can call uh, the number of resolvable points kind of the number of resolves of the system. So here's uh, with this objective, you have about seven mega resolves um, of basically of information that, that the objective can, can transmit. Um, with this uh, system, our goal is to uh, you know have a five millimeter field of view, a little bit smaller NA, um, um, and here you can see we have about nine times increase in the eton do 
about a nine times increase in the, the, the resolvable elements. Um, and so this is kind of the, <laughs> the, the long-winded development of, of why um, um, this is kind of a, you know, a, a challenging thing. You know, it's, it's, it's not you know, a set of lenses you'll find on the shelf. And let's see, did I? I guess the one thing, other thing that I didn't, I didn't touch on is, is, is the conservation of ethan due through an optical system. So, uh, and, and kind of tying ethan due to information, I think, you know, makes this pretty easy to understand in, in an intuitive sense. Um, you, know, you can certainly um, decrease or, or destroy information as it goes through the optical system in the same way you can destroy uh, or decrease ethan due. You can just, you know, put a block in there and absorb all the light. But you cannot increase the ethan due as it goes through the optical system um, or increase information as it goes through the system. Um, and um, as this ethan due is kind of a physical quantity, just like information is, you can see that every lens along the, op the optical system has to be able to, to transmit and, and control light with that extent of ethan due. Um, so, you know, it makes no sense to take a microscope, which is designed to operate at one level of ethan due and replace one lens in it um, to increase the ethan due because you'll be limited by all the rest of the lenses in, in the microscope. So, so you know these are uh, the reasons why you know, we designed all the lenses from scratch uh, with this system. Now, um, uh, let's see. Uh, just uh, you know, one, once again, uh, the, the specs again. Um, I basically said that already. I'm going to say is you know you have a laser beam coming into the system. A laser beam is kind of a minimum ethan due creation. You know, a laser beam is a very bright thing, and the, the fundamental unit of brightness is power per area per steroid. It's basically brightness, you know, basically energy per unit of ethan due. And and you know we use laser beams because because they have, they're very bright, they have very high radiance, and they, they do that by by having power in the smallest ethan due kind of space as possible. And you know, Gaussian beam is, is basically exactly that. You know, it'll have the, the smallest amount of, you know, it'll be a, as well collimated as possible for a given physical size, or you know, it'll, it'll focus down to, to the smallest spot um, possible given given a certain NA or, or cone angle. Um, so you know, so so we have this extremely low ethan due um, entity going into a microscope that has a very high ethan due. So how does that work? And that's that's basically what a scanning microscope is and what a scan mirror does. It's, it's basically, you know, I, I just said you can't increase ethan due through a system with a passive component, but um, in a time average way with an active component, a scanning mirror, you can um, increase the ethan due. And that's that's you know basically what scan mirrors uh, or any scanning system in a microscope and a laser scanning microscope does. Um, and and you know what's uh, um, you know a good way to think about it, I like to think about it, is that, is that you know, that basically the, you're, you're adding at time, like I said, in the time average sense, at any one point in time, you're not, but averaged over time, you are. And the amount of at time that you can add to the system uh, goes basically exactly like the aperture of the scan mirror times the scan range of that scan mirror. Um, and uh, for any one scan mirror, it only goes well in one angular direction, but for two scan mirrors. Um, so, so you know that's basically what a scan mirror does. Uh, we're gonna get to it. Uh, we have a, a field of a depth field of view, and um, it's just a, a lot of resolvable points within that large you know, volume of, of tissue, and we want to scan as, as fast as possible um, in order to, 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 to get the data that we need. Um, um, so you're basically limited, um, you know, the, basically the, the, what we chose to, to, to be our, our fastest scanner, every scanning system will have kind of a fastest scanner and then a less fast, fast scanner that goes in a different dimension and then a less fast, uh, and then, you know, a slower scanner that goes in a different dimension. Our fastest scanner uh, that we use for this microscope is, is, a, is a resonance scanning mirror. Um, um, and this is kind of a, an image one here. Uh, it's a mirror on the end of a, uh, a torsion spring um, that, that uh, oscillates at resonance. Um, and uh, you know, the, the one that we use goes at 12 kilohertz and has a five millimeter aperture. And, and that's kind of 
you know, the, the largest aperture they, they make, um, and it only has a 10 degree scan angle. Um, so so you know, just multiplying the aperture by the scan angle and knowing what the final numerical aperture is directly gives us the um, you know, how long of a, a scan line um, this will produce and, and at, the, at the sample um, uh, that we are imaging. And, and so with, with our, kind of our, our fast scanning mirror here, we can really only see a stripe in our uh, field of view, uh, which, which has a width of, like I said, about 650 microns over this whole kind of five millimeter field of view. Um, uh, so then we have a gal galvo mirror. Um, I mean, I'm not going to describe what a gamma mirror is. We're really running out of time. Um, um, that can scan up and down. And we have another gamma mirror that scans this whole stripe back and forth. So, so what we have is kind of two galvo mirrors, which can um, take the, the line that the resident mirror scans and kind of moves it around the whole field. So, I guess just a summary, like um, from the previous slide, what what if I understand it right, you're trying to basically preserve the um, information and intensity over a large area, and that's um, done well and fast by this resonance scanner. And the Galvo Galvo scanner projects that across the entire field of view. Am I right? It's yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, the motivation. you need the resonance scanner to to get um, uh, a faster scan rate to just yeah. make your pixel rate high enough um, to to be usable. Um, and and you use the, the galvos to basically you know, boost the atom view that you're creating. You know the, the field of view that you can access um, at at your final NA um, uh, on top yep. of the on top of the resonance scanner. Yep. Yeah. Fantastic. Yep. Yep. Um, so and so and then uh, what I haven't got to yet is we also have a, a, a mechanism to quickly scan. The plane of the imaging, um, and we, and I, I will show that in the next slide or two. We'll definitely get to that. Um, and uh, when you add that all together, that's what, what we um, uh, kind of called in, in this instance a random access scanning, where you, where you can take kind of patches of of data and and move them anywhere within this large volume, uh, five millimeter yeah. diameter or one millimeter. Yeah. Um, um, and uh, and just to throw a couple numbers on that, you know, a, a patch of this data um, is 600 by 600 microns, and uh, you can jump between patches uh, in about six milliseconds with, with the scanning system that we have. And and this is from from the paper I don't remember if I even mentioned. Um, you know, the the development of this was, was myself. Um, um, Nick Safranina and, and Carl Svoboda. Um, uh, we, we work together um, uh, a lot. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, here is the actual design of the microscope. Uh, this is straight from ZMAX optical design software. And these are all, all the actual lenses here, or pictures of the lenses. Um, um, and I'll go through step by step here. Um, so this is the um, axial uh, scanning mechanism that I talked about, the, the focus scanning or remote focusing. Um, you know, in order to get this to be quick, um, um, you have to you know make the thing that you move uh, move as little as possible. To do that, you basically put a mirror into a high NA space. So you have a, uh, an objective here, which doesn't do any imaging really. It just focuses the light onto this mirror. And then you put the mirror onto uh, a linear stage, in this case, a, a voice coil, um, kind of like a speaker basically. Um, and as that mirror moves um, in and out, you see here the light that reflects from it, goes back through the objective, bounces off of, uh, this is a polarizing beam splitter here, and we have a quarter wave plate here, so the light goes in this way and it comes out this way. You can see here the actual the uh, axial scanning of the light um, as you move the objective. And you see you move the objective a little bit. Here's a, a small 
here's a high NA space, and then this kind of lower NA space, the, the focus scans a lot. Um, so, so that's just you know, a quick visual of, of how the, the remote focusing works. Um, here's uh, the, the resonance scan mirror, and just so you can see as it scans, here the light um, scans laterally. Here, in this view, you can't get a good view of the Galvo scan mirrors, but we can see that soon. We have scan lens, you know, roughly a scan lens and a tube lens and an objective. And so, let's see, that time is right. Let's see. Um, well, I, uh, I guess I, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll do this slide and then, and then we'll, we'll have to start uh, skipping things more thoroughly. Um, uh, so, so, um, you know, if you were to look at that 16x objective that I mentioned before, that, you know, it's easy to buy, people uh, use it uh, for neuroscience um, all the time. It actually has about, well, it has 16 lenses inside. I took one of them apart, actually, at one point that was a little broken. Um, uh, and so now, you know, I, I told you that uh, increasing that tendu will make things a lot harder. But if you, if you look here, this objective only has one, two, three. By six lenses inside of it. So, you know, what's the deal with that? How did we, um, you know, make it so that we don't need 20 or 25 or something lenses inside of our objective? Um, I think that's definitely an interesting thing to talk about. Um, you know, one is the numerical aperture is a little lower, and um, and in a way, numerical aperture is, is kind of a harder thing to correct than than field of view. So, so that helps you know a little bit more than than you know the kind of decrease in that undo that, you know, linearly that it gives us. Um, the most important thing, though, is, is field curvature. Um, and um, what to say about field curvature, in a way, it's, it's you know, there, there are different ways you could kind of define, you know, <clears throat> imaging in which field curvature is not really an aberration. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of unnatural for the for the for a field, you know, the, for the object field um, or the image to be planes in the first place. You know, everything in, in optics is, is already kind of spherical surfaces, um, and and you know, basically when you do lens design, you, you find that that a tremendous amount of complexity in optical systems comes from correcting field curvature, um, which you know, like I said, is, is only really an aberration if you define that the, the, the the, the object surface should be a plane in the first place, um, um, and you know, and, and this is you know a, a big difference between uh, custom uh, optical systems like this, which work in bulk tissue and always work in bulk tissue, and commercial microscopes, which um, you know are almost always designed around working on a slide, which is a plane, or putting an image onto a camera, which is also uh, a plane. Um, so by by um, allowing field curvature in the system, uh, that you know pretty much kind of straight off it at least halves the amount of, of optical elements that, that you need. Um, um, we're also two photon only, um, you know, which, which means we don't need chromatic correction. This is why I haven't talked about chromatic aberrations. Um, clearly, I don't really have time to. Um, Another very important thing is that the system is, is minimally modularized, and and what I kind of mean by that um, um, is that you know in, in a normal microscope you can you know leave a bunch of objects there and swap an objective with a different objective, and and the reason why you can do that um, relatively easily is because you know you, you've defined kind of the inputs and outputs in the space between the rest of the microscope and the objective, and more importantly than that. Um, those inputs and outputs are, are, are basically plane waves, um, and um, you know, that's, well, well, plane wave. Um, and where there's a space where there's plane waves, you know, the the, um, the, the alignment of the optical system on one side and the other gets gets very very lax. Um, you know, as you of course if you, as you translate a plane wave, nothing happens because it's a plane. Um, and and in these spaces, you know, the, the angle of the plane wave uh, corresponds to the, the point in, in, in field space, right, kind of the field coordinate uh, of, of the microscope. And so, so even the, the angular um, um, alignment doesn't matter very much. Um, uh, 
because if, you know if, if that if that angular alignment gets off, then you, you basically just shifted the field a tiny bit, which which isn't a problem. It's, you know, it's not an imaging aberration; it hasn't been created. Um, um, so, uh, but when you when you create a you know really well corrected space in between optical elements, that means you need to do all of the correction in each element individually. Uh, and you need to have a very well corrected objective that takes you know you know you know perfect sphere waves. Uh, spherical waves on one side and makes them you know perfect planar waves as, you know, as good as you can um, on the other side you need all that correction in the objective and then you need to go from those perfect planar waves to perfect spherical waves kind of here at an intermediate image space you know with, within this other um, element so so that's one problem with with modularizing the system another problem with and another you know reason why we, we don't care about modularizing well so you know you know, we, we can not care about modularizing the system if we, if, you know, we, we don't assume you, you're going to be able to, you know, switch this objective with another one easily. And also, you know, we, we, we basically rigidly connect these as, as well as possible so that they won't move. This, this optic never, never moves and never gets changed. Um, um, that allows us to make it not as modular. And also, um, it doesn't really make sense for it to be modular when it's a, Multi-planar system when it when it has this axial scanning because you know there's only one plane and one position of this mirror in which you're going to have planar wave fronts here anyway. Um, um, so so anyway, uh, it's not modular. It's you know everything is it's kind of locked down uh, mechanically as well as possible and, and, and aligned as well as possible um, by the mechanical design and, and also. Um, you know, we don't use the intermediate image plane. It's it's not well corrected there, um, <clears throat> um, and you know what, what this allows us to do is, is to take you know uh, corrections which would have had to happen you know all in one optic and kind of spread them out through many different optics. So so in a way, rather than thinking of it as a well corrected objective and a well corrected tube lens and a well corrected scan lens, this, this entire optical system is kind of one lens that corrects. Um, the light from the, the scan mirrors here to the to the um, uh, to the sample right here, and um, and so that's um, a, again a, a kind of a different design philosophy than 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 kind of normal microscope manufacturing and something that, that allows us to you know, dramatically simplify the design. Um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to talk about Zmax tips for anybody who actually does optical design, um, but uh, I'm really going to skip all of that. But if somebody wants to ask about it, I'll, I'll come back to it later. Um, you know, here is mechanically, uh, you, know, you know, in real life, what, what the thing looks like, uh, you know, what we just saw is, is uh, contained within it uh, in these places right here. Um, you know, this kind of large thing is a voice coil actuator that the remote focus mirror moves on. Um, let's see, here's, you know, this is the 16x objective I, I mentioned a couple times. Um, to scale, this is the objective of this microscope. It is, it is larger, you know, larger Anton do kind of leads to larger lenses almost always. You either need to make the lenses larger or you need to make, you know, the, 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 their acceptance angle larger. and, and the acceptance angle onto the lenses can only get so large before the aberrations get really bad. So the lenses almost always get, get much larger when you increase it. Um, you know, here's the specs again, which we've seen. Uh, here's collection optics. Uh, you know, depending on how we want to split up the next, you know, eight minutes, I can give a little more details about a few parts here, the remote focus. Probably, probably I think the, the robot scanning will be very interesting and then um, yeah. Optics, yeah. Yeah, I mean that you know there's uh, there's different kinds of remote focusing systems. Um, uh, you know the kind of the canonical kind and the original work um at Botry B um, uh, is that uh, you do the lateral scanning first and then the axial scanning. Um, and here's kind of a picture of how that looks. Um, the problem with that is that, you know, the, the eton do of your remote focus objective needs to match the eton do of your final objective. And so, you know, our remote focus objective would have to be, you know, as big and as complicated as our final objective. 
in the end, this ended up, didn't end up being a huge amount less complicated or less expensive, but when, when we were designing this, you know, we didn't know how expensive this thing would be. Um, so we really wanted to do everything we could to, to you, know, you know, make the thing more economical and feasible to build. Um, so we decided to do, you know, like, you know, we have to go back to the, the image here where you see the first thing that happens is that the axial scanning happens, and then we do all of the lateral scanning. And, and um, you know, let's see, I'll talk about that. I'll talk about it a little later. Um, that's all I'll say about that now. I'll, I'll move on to the, the Galvos. Um, I think there's something that I think some of you are interested in. Maybe Steve, you, you mentioned some interest in. Um, you know, yeah, I, I think that the quickest way is to say it is that, you know, there's you know, like I said, there's there's <clears throat> there's an object plane or an image plane in a microscope where where things are very simple. You know, you have points and they all emit you know a cone of light in the same direction basically. And you have a pupil plane in a microscope, which is also kind of a very simplified space where you know from every point in the field, you know, you have a plane wave at the pupil plane, and and the angle of that plane wave depends on the position of the of the 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 emitter in, in, the, in, the, in the sample plane. Um, so the, the pupil plane is kind of a special place in a microscope and is, and is, and is usually, you know, exactly where you want to put a, a scanning mirror, uh, such that, you know, scanning the mirror exactly looks like, you know, changing the field in the microscope. Um, uh, for a microscope, it's not modularized in the way that you can always have plane waves at the pupil plane or, you know, for one that, you know, where you have this, you know, multi-conjugate system where you have remote focusing, um, 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 you know, there, there's, you know, it basically becomes extremely important that you put the, the mirror at the pupil plane. And um, so there are microscope systems where um, you can have two mirrors that are, you know, neither of them at the pupil plane, but they're kind of close to the pupil plane. And, and that works fine because, you know, in this pupil space, there's, there's plane waves all the time. So, so, uh, so you know, when, when they move away from the pupil plane, this and they scan, what it kind of does is it is it effectively makes it so that you know all of your upstream optics and all your downstream optics kind of translate relative to each other, but that's okay. Um, um, here, you know, where we don't have plane waves in this space, uh, uh, most of the time, you know, we, we can't have translations. You know, that's basically like a hard, um, you know. It's like a hard misalignment of, of the optical system, and, and, and you get you know very very large uh, aberrations as a result of that. So you know normally in in, in in this case when you need your scan mirror to be uh, right at the pupil plane, and when your scan mirror only moves in one direction, two scan mirrors to scan in, in, in two dimensions is you'll image one scan mirror onto the other scan mirror um, um, with with a lens system. Now in this case, you now that lens system would have to you know, transmit the full eton do of, you know, the final optics of the microscope. And that lens system has to be very large and thus expensive. Um, so what we did, we kind of cheated a little bit um, and kind of virtually imaged one scan uh, mirror onto another by using two scan mirrors in one dimension. And as you see here, they both move at the same time in, the, in such a way that you have kind of this virtual pupil down here. And it's not perfect imaging. Um, and, and, and what that means is that as you scan, the optical path length from here to here changes a little bit. Um, but um, that's something that our system could tolerate. Um, and, uh, and that's how that system works. So, um, just a quick um, um, overview. So this is not where the resonance scanners are, I suppose. It's uh, such a correction mechanism, yeah. right? These are the... the, the the Galvo mirrors, yeah. I see. Right. So the so this light going in is already doing the resonance scan. I see. Um, right. I mean, it's these mirrors, but that, that scan is relatively small. I see. Cool. Um, imaging objective. So this is just you know, I, I, you know, by doing all the the custom optical design, you know, for this one specific purpose, you know, it allowed you know certain optimizations. Uh, again, you know, I talked about some of them. That you can't get with, with commercial optics, which are you know not designed for a specific purpose. Um, you know, one that I like a lot is is you know I, I realize it'd be very easy to 
have a separate excitation NA and collection NA in the objective. So this is these are the excitation rays. So these these are you know the rays of light that are going down um, into the uh, sample down here, which would be the, the mouse brain. And and this is what they look like at an NA of 0.6. And this is where they are well corrected, uh, you know, diffraction limited, basically all the aberrations are low. Um, but um, you could make it, you know, make, if you make the lenses thick enough and just increase the aperture of the lenses, you can collect light at, at a higher NA. And here we have a collection at an NA of one. And now this light going through the objective at an NA of one is not at all diffraction limited, it has huge aberrations. But uh, for a two-photon microscope, you collect all the light uh, right onto a, uh, you know, the collection is uh, non-imaging optics. It's, it's uh, just collecting all the light onto um, uh, a photo cathode of the EMT. And so it doesn't matter if there's a lot of aberrations. So, so that's something that we did with this microscope. Um, the collection optics, um, you know, Steve, you had also mentioned something about that. Um, yes. yeah. uh, you know, just very briefly, you know, again, here's the, Objective, collecting the light coming from the, uh, the brain. And this is light coming out in, in every direction and, and kind of simulate, this is a non-imaging um, um, optical model. And here the light all comes here is a, a very large collection lens. It's kind of the largest lens in the system, I think, although it's relatively small, <laughs> large tolerances. Um, uh, this is, the interesting thing is that, you know, because we have light coming from, uh, you know, we. Again, it's et on We have a five millimeter field of view um, that's, and we're collecting light coming out in NA of one. Um, we want to collect the light onto a photocathode. The photocathode itself for this type of PMT, uh, the largest we can get is five millimeters in, in diameter. Now, if we want to collect the light onto that five millimeter diameter photocathode in an NA of one and we have air, then you know, we need to collect light at you know, a full cone angle, you know, all the way out to two pi and there's you know, no optic that can that can really do that. Um, so uh, how we solve this problem is by gluing this lens to the to the PMT. Um, um, there's an, an immersion fluid or just a, an optical adhesive between the lens and the photocathode. And what that basically does is, you know, it's the same thing as using an immersion fluid and a, and a microscope you can get a higher NA if you increase the index of refraction next to your image. And, and <coughs> And here we do that with this lens that basically uh, effectively makes the photo capital larger. Um, and that's you know, something else we did. Um, and something else basically we had to do because of the increase in that how do. Um, tolerancing, I really, really don't have time to talk about tolerancing. I, I, the very basic thing I'll say is that, you know, when you design lenses, um, you spend about half the time actually designing lenses and half the time doing tolerance analysis. Maybe it's like two thirds of the first and one third of the other, but uh, it's, uh, it's a big aspect of, of lens design because you know, lens design is all about very high precision manufacturing. Every, you know, everything needs to be precise in the end to the level of kind of a wavelength of light. So you, you, you're talking like about micron tolerances on things. It's very difficult to, to do the manufacturing and you need to you know, very carefully know, you know what tolerances are acceptable on the manufacturing um, in order to make it manufacturable. Um, I won't talk about that more. Um, I won't talk about that. You know, this I can go through very quickly. It's just uh, data from the microscope. You know, here uh, data that we that Nick and I took for the, the paper. Um, point spread functions here. You know, they look good here, kind of in the center of the field. Here, um, you know, at, at one plane, as we go across the plane, uh, this is you know the, the size of the point spread function. This is the brightness of the the, the focus. Um, and uh, you know the you know it's quite even over about two uh, two millimeter radius you know four millimeter field of view um, it, it does get uh, does degrade a lot out to a six millimeter field of view um, you know I think it's it's, it's uh, relatively usable out of five millimeters you know we maybe didn't quite hit our goal of five millimeter field of view but that that always happens when you manufacture optics you know, it's never perfect. Um, and you find that definitely in uh, objectives you buy from microscope manufacturers. Um, so this, I mean, this is this slide is this kind of thing that I'm most proud of. It's, it's really the how well the remote focusing works, and and this is something that's unique. You know, so other people have designed kind of mesoscope system, you know, kind of high Eton view optics. There are systems out there that, that have you know, just 
that, that have very high F on duty, you know, like steppers for um, lithography, for microscope man or for you know microchip manufacturing. Um, but but you know for, for this uh, what I think is, is very unique is that we have this high F on duty system with the remote focusing and the remote focusing is, is built into the design um, um, from the very beginning. So everything is as corrected as possible for, for remote focusing. So if you look at remote focusing literature um, um, you know, usually what you'll see is that you know, at the center of the lateral field of view, you can move the focus up and down and it goes about as far as you think it should be able to go. Or if you look at the center of the axial field of view, um, you, know, you could scan laterally, you know, just like a regular microscope and, and, and that looks fine. But as, as, you, as you scan out at, in both of them simultaneously, out axially and laterally, um, things get bad quickly and, and, and in a way that's, that's, that's not um, captured by you know, the, the, the basic you know, theory of how the remote focusing is, is supposed to work. And, and so, you know, really your, your, the, 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 the shape of the thing that you can image is, you know, it's not like a cylinder like I showed you before, you know, five millimeter in diameter, one millimeter in height. It's really, you know, an ellipsoid um, and you can't get anywhere close to, to the edges of, of, of it. Um, and usually they don't even show you what the performance looks like as you go out and after they just show it to you what it looks like axially in the middle and laterally in the middle. Um, um, but, but here, you know, th this is, you know, the, um, the point spread uh, function um, at the top, bottom, middle, um, left, right, um, at three different depths of 200 microns, 500 microns, 1,000 microns. And, and you can see that it's pretty consistent across depths. And, um, and this is something that I think is, you know, you know I haven't seen any, any other system that, that can show this, this sort of um, uh, remote focusing, uh, you know, multi-conjugate kind of performance. Um, so, so that is you know, the thing that I, I like to talk about. Um, I'm going to ask uh, and a again, question. Um, yeah, yeah. Just a previous slide. Um, just a quick question on brightness versus uh, full wave half maximum. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it seems like the full wave half maximum is maintained fairly well, but the brightness still drops. Is it because of the collection optics? Uh, and no. So I think it's just because the the PSF size is actually I think not a great metric to use for. Yeah. Um, I don't think it was ever a great metric to use for for um, um, quantifying the, the performance of a of a microscope or how close it is to being diffraction limited, um, because I think it actually it, it varies pretty slowly as as um, as kind of the aberrations increase and and and, and you you know there there are a lot of aberrations certainly like spherical aberration and, and others too that that as they increase you know what happens is that the point spread function doesn't get bigger right away, but you kind of get power that, that goes away from the central peak of the point spread function and goes into kind of the rings, you know, it usually looks like a, a peak and kind of has rings. Um, so, you know, a, a much better, but much more difficult to measure, you know, a performance variable would be the Strel ratio, but that's, you know, that's, um, you know, that's defined as the ratio of the kind of the maximum intensity um, versus, you know, a perfect diffraction limited system. Of course, you don't have a perfect diffraction limited system to compare it to, and and having a you know kind of an absolute intensity measurement is very difficult. Um, so I mean, these right here are kind of relative Strel ratio measurements. Um, they right. show how the how the brightness changes, um, and and you know they're just always going to go much faster than than the size of the the point spread function changes. Um, um, in the end, I think it's probably what people care about more. Um, is, is, you know, especially in two photon imaging, because this, yeah. you know, directly tell you what your signal to noise ratio is going to be. Um, uh, but, you know, um, you know, it, luckily, you know, we're almost always working in a regime where, where, you know, we have a good amount of signal to noise ratio and it could go down quite a bit and still get usable data. Um, so, you know, I'd say, you know, this, this is much lower than, than it is here, but, but I still think, you know, people, yeah. people operate out there. Yeah. 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 And like I said, you know, when you compare this with actual objectives made by microscope manufacturers that you know, we, we tend to think of as being um, diffraction limited, you know, you will often find that they, uh, they they perform just as badly out at the edge of their you know, kind of defined field of view. I mean, you, yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, they, that's cool. Yeah. Manufacturers do their best to avoid telling you, you know, what the performance is. You know, so 
<laughs> they don't usually tell you. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 um, it's if it's all good, bad, it's could you clarify uh, if if this is a, like two photon brightness or like one photon brightness? I guess. Yeah, this is this is two photon. So this is um, uh, yeah, just imaging beads um, uh, in two photon, um, uh, and uh, and I think yeah, that's just you know the maximum pixel value at the center, you know, throughout the the, the stack, the, the image stack of the bead. Oh, and I, I guess we could move to field correction a little bit. Yeah, let's see. Uh, don't want to talk about that at all or that at all. Field curvature correction, you know, it's, it's you know, there, there is field curvature. I, you know, a lot of people don't care about it, actually, uh, and don't turn on the field curvature correction, I, I've found. But it is possible to, to basically correct the field curvature when you have the, the very fast focusing uh, capability that we have with the remote focusing. So, so you're just, you know, uh, taking an image of a, of a very thin um, layer of fluorescence with the field curvature uncorrected and with it corrected. Uh, I mean, this doesn't look a whole lot better. This doesn't look a whole lot better, but this is, this is um, the, the scales of these two things are very different. Um, so it actually is relatively flat. The, the problem is you cannot move the, the, the focus fast enough to compensate for the resonant mirror moving. So we're always going to have this kind of sawtooth in one dimension. Um, um, that being said, you, you can move the, res the remote focus mirror fast enough to correct the field curvature in the other dimension, which is why yeah, I see these kind of lines. It's pretty flat this way, but, uh, but you still get these, these little uh, sawtooths going in the other direction. I guess you could interlace them if you take the subsequent frames. And that, that yeah, I, mean, in the end, I mean, if you're just imaging neurons in a brain, uh, as long as you, you you know approximately you know what layer that's in where it is, it doesn't matter if you're exactly imaging a, a plane or not. You know, there's I no see. plane in the brain itself. So yeah, um, well let's see, we're way over time now. I mean, look at the clock a lot, but we do get to the nice uh, videos um, of what the data looks like. Um, yeah, so this is a video put together by Nick. Uh, data taken by by Nick. Um, he's now with uh, the, the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation. So this is this is going up and down. You know, we went down to about 650 microns and going up. So just showing how you know, good-looking images throughout the full depth. Now that's you know that's moving the remote focusing mirror, and you know we, <clears throat> this is you know just a large patch of neurons. You can see neurons throughout a lot of it. So just you know kind of thinking about how many neurons you can record from simultaneously um, is, is kind of a big goal of a lot of people. Uh, you know obviously if you could record from all the neurons in the brain at the same time, you get a lot of useful things. Um, Here's kind of an illustration of random access scanning. We took, you know, looking at a few different patches in the data. Again, you know, um, you know, if you go over that that whole area, the, the the rate is relatively slow, kind of one hertz around there. And if you use just a few patches, you know, you can go higher, something like ten hertz imaging, um, which for the dynamics of calcium indicators is, I guess, fast enough. Yeah. So, see some parts of it I did design the, the, the gantry designed by Thor Labs, some electrical boxes designed by other members of JET, which back then was called IENF. Um, the software from the microscope, uh, mostly developed by Vidrio Technology. Um, workshop and commercialization, we had, uh, so we did a workshop. Here's Carl, here's, uh, here's myself. There's uh, representatives from I uh, think 12 labs came. Um, all agreed to purchase parts kind of at the same time so we could coordinate purchasing, you know, get um, cheaper parts that way. Um, um, and build uh, mesoscope in their own labs and, and we showed them how to uh, put them together and align them. Um, I think uh, most of them have successfully uh, got their microscopes up and running now. Um, um, the, the biggest uh, reason why you want to do this uh, workshop like this though uh, you know, we, we hope that, that other labs would, would kind of take the documentation and, and build their own mesoscope. I don't know if anybody's done that now, but, but, uh, but you know, when you can show a lot of interest, 
um, and get a lot of documentation going, then it's much easier to get uh, commercialization to happen. So Thor Labs uh, will sell you the microscope. It's you know in a state that's pretty close to, to how we designed it. Um, and so we have those 12 labs that have uh, built the microscope through the workshop. Um, and uh, Thor Labs has sold, I think, about 20. It's, it's hard to, to, to know exactly um, with them, but um, uh, I think that's, you know, so that's that's about the number of, of these microscopes that are out in the world now. Um, maybe it's more than 20 now, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I want to just uh, mention a couple of people who are users um, here at Camellia. Um, and we've done a lot of work uh, with the mesoscope. Um, you know, Marius Pachitariu and Carson Stringer both have labs here at Camellia. Um, they've uh, published a, a nice paper um, here uh, with data from a mesoscope. Um, and also, uh, it's important to say, uh, written uh, software, which is very important. And I think a lot of people, uh, other mesoscope users, uh, use to do the data analysis. Um, so if you're interested, you can check out their labs. Um, um, Dmitry Cebulski uh, is in the JET department um, with me, and he's kind of a, a second uh, expert in, in this system now, and does a lot of uh, work with it with, with our own systems. We have two mesoscopes here, and we're building a third one. Um, let's see here, Dmitry uh, also designed a, a dual plane add-on for the mesoscope, uh, which uh, basically doubles the amount of, of uh, data that you can get from it. Um, by, by imaging from two planes simultaneously. Um, let's see, I know there's, there's a few of these at the Allen Institute for Brain Science. Uh, I guess I don't know too much about it, so <laughs> I should have mentioned it. Um, uh, at, uh, another interesting thing, um, uh, Ali Pasha Vaziri and his lab at the Rockefeller University um, uh, has developed uh, another uh, interesting add-on uh, which uh, you could read about, uh, which is also designed to increase um, the amount, you know, just more cells per unit of time. Uh, you know, it's a multi-focal approach that um, uh, that allows you, to, uh, yeah, get get more data, um, uh, and it's kind of built on the the, the mesoscope system. Um, um, so, interesting stuff from the community. Uh, uh, I mean, we're way over time. Um, it's all right. Uh, usually, we have time right now me. so uh, I, I think you're, you're probably right on time. <laughs> if oh, really? we put a discussion and, and, and questions. So, um, uh, I guess the next slide you're showing is the mirror scope. That's very yeah. I mean, this is, so so like I said, the the micro, the, the mesoscope is uh, was was basically done um, um, as far as my work goes uh, a few years ago, and so since then, my major project has been in this system, and this is with uh, Philip Keller, uh, his lab at Chimelia, and uh, Ben Kwan Wong, uh, postdoc in his lab. So I'm developing it with them, just very much an analogy with, with uh, Carl and, and, uh, and Nick Sopraniev uh, with the mesoscope. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, this is basically, you know, this is the lenses of this system, and this was designed a few years ago now. Um, um, it's large. It uses a big mirror, um, which which allows you to handle a lot of it. On do with, with low aberration, the way we use it, which is why we have a mirror and why it's called basically the mirror scope. Um, we have this very large uh, space filled with immersion fluid. In this case, water. We have a specimen that goes inside of it. So you have this kind of funky geometry. Light goes out this way, reflects from the mirror, comes back this way, and then goes to an image surface over here. Um, but uh, because of the design, you know, we get very large amount of it under here. We have a 12 millimeter diameter filter base and an NA of uh, 1.0. So, you know, if we looked before, we had something like seven mega resoles with a, you know, stock, you know, microscope system. We went up about times 10 for the mesoscope, and now we've gone up you know, more than times 10 above that to this system. And, uh, and so, you know, we, we have an, an application for this, which, you know, I won't talk about now. Uh, which, which doesn't doesn't use up nearly, <laughs> which is only a small fraction of, of these of these uh, of, of this information, and you know, we're still looking for for other things we could do with with, with this much optical performance. Uh, but, uh, but you know, uh, it's good we have one 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 application now, and, and hopefully you know with with, uh, with 
capability more applications will come in the future. Um, and, uh, I mean, I don't need to talk about this. So you, I'm going to talk about a little a bit of the other optical capabilities that we've kind of developed in my department um, since, uh, in, in the JET department, um, since uh, the mesoscope was done. But uh, well, I, don't know, I think I'll, I'll, I'll just go straight to uh, um, some acknowledgments. These are, these are people that helped. This is an old slide, but, uh, except I added Dimitri to it. Um, these are all people that helped with, uh, within my department with the development of the mesoscope. Um, of course, the people in Carl's lab um, and other people, Janelia, that helped with the workshop um, and with the design. Uh, had a couple of consultants, we talked a little bit about optical design. Um, Julie Bentley is a professor of lens design at the University of Rochester, uh, you know, gave us some helpful tips and tricks. And uh, I think that's it. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I think um, Dan, it's um, it's 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 actually very clear uh, to some extent the 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 uh, discussion of that don't do in terms of information um, transfer from the scan optics to the imaging optics. Um, um, perhaps I, I start off with a few questions. I think you talk about scanning points and over volume. Uh, there will be a degree of spatial variation in aberrations as you change that mm -hmm. scan point. And field correction is probably not an aberration like we mentioned, it's more of a depth of field, uh, depth of focus change. So would that be, how would you envisage a adaptive optic system that would be compatible with the mesoscope such that you can correct for this sort of spatial varying uh, aberration. Um, we said an adaptive optics system. Yeah, well, a, a DM, right? Some way to correct for spatial distortions, uh, actual distortions in the sample rather than the optics. Probably, I would. Yeah, I mean, so, um, but so you know, I'm I'm in general interested in in the way that you so. You know, I don't know if that, this will exactly answer your question, um, but you know, I, I think. You know, optical systems for a long time were defined just with you know two, you know one, one image location, one you know one object location, one image location. Uh, um, and so you know the the way that aberrations are defined, you know, kind of kind of assumes that. And and you know when, when you talk about multi conjugate systems where mm -hmm. you're going to move these location, you know the the, the locations of these planes in Z and and Propagation direction, um, um, it's it's um, so so there are expressions for how the aberrations will change as you do that, um, but I think um, I still you know sometimes wonder if there is a more if there's a different way to define things which, which makes things a little a little clearer. And so so one thing that you'll find is that is that well I don't know I don't know if I want to talk about it. I mean so so. It's interesting to talk about aberrations and and, and you know what their dependencies are on, yeah. on various things, but, but in the end, I, I, I just ask Zmax to find a design that works, and I try to you know model as much of the system as possible. Um, so you know I, I modeled it all the way from you know with all the scan mirrors in it and with all the lenses in it at once, and have all the rays go through and just kind of optimize globally um, as much as possible because then I don't have to. Think about the aberrations <laughs> and how to balance them. You know, it, it all happens. So, so maybe my, my question is so, so so, more focused on to the sample distortion, right? So I guess a lot of what's been designed allows you to image relatively large field of views, um, retaining as much of the NA um, in the excitation optics. And if that were to be distorted in the sample, would there be a, a additional options? In other words, you talk about um, I guess having the remote axial scanning uh, done af um, before the lateral scans, and that mm -hmm. gives you so this sort of advantage in in uh, achieving um, you know well you you actually have less distortion when you are doing remote scanning. Yeah, so so 
in most optical systems, I don't think you could add on the, you know, that initial axial scan mm -hmm. without it causing the problems that I, that I mentioned where, I where, you know, it, it works in the center of the field of view. Um, but, but as you go out towards the edges of the lateral field of view, the axial scanning, you know, it makes things get screwed up. And, and I think that's, so, you know, I, I think that's basically because um, of aberrations which people don't think about very often, like pupil mm -hmm. aberrations, and the pupil aberrations get turned into imaging aberrations when you move the conjugate plane around. Um, um, and so, so I think, you know, it only works in this system because, you know, it was optimized all at the same time and all the aberrations that do count, which are mm -hmm. ones which, you know, there's not even an operand in ZMAX that you could easily calculate them. Um, 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 you know, all, all those are just kind of automatically taken care of by the design. So, so I think you know, all the downstream stuff just, you know, because it was all, all optimized at the same time, you know, has, you know, whatever aberrations need to be low, pupil aberrations, which, which are kind of like an inverse way of looking at the imaging aberrations, um, and, and which, which aren't talked about very often. Um, you know, those, those things, you know, are what they need to be to make this work. Um, but, you know, like I said, I, I think in most cases it, it, it won't work as well by just adding uh, it on. And, and unfortunately, you know, maybe it's possible to, well, not in mind. Um, um, so, you know, and, and, and of course with adaptive optics, you know, you, you can correct a lot of things, but but, but if what you're trying to correct is has a field dependence and you're trying to scan over the field very quickly, you know, of course you can't you can't change your, your adaptive optics you know, right. function you know, quickly in order in order to fix that. So so you know, I, okay. you know. I, I guess uh, the the next question is from from Chen. Uh, she asked um, if um, what limits the actual range of the remote scanning? Um, is 0.7 millimeter associated with what you've described in the yeah, I mean, so, the, and so like every other kind of boundary and object is a very, very fuzzy boundary. And, you know, it's it's all based on definitions. I think the 0.7, I'm not really, I mean, I, I think it's it's definitely been used at greater than 0.7. Um, right. um, but, you know, it, it's, it's a very fuzzy boundary and, and they're all basically the same. You know, they're, they're all a little different, but they're all in the same as a, you know, Certain aberrations get too large, and 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 you know make the image quality get too bad. Um, and you have to you know draw a line in the sand always at, at what's too bad and what's you know, what's too large. So 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 you know like, like I said you know all, all aberrations are there all the time at, at some degree, and you know it's, it's just impossible to make them zero um, everywhere. Um, so so, yep. you know, so I, I guess any any questions from um, the current audience um, on, on scanning optics. Hi, Dan, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, so just going back to the, um, uh, going back to that large image, the video you had, um, mm -hmm. uh, I noticed there were some lines. If you want to go back to it, I noticed there were some yeah, lines. Yeah. I was just wondering if that's um, because of the scanning system that you have. Yeah, exactly. So those are the stripes um, that I was mentioning so, so when the data was taken, it would, it would be taken in a stripe like this, and then a stripe like this, and then a stripe like this. Um, so I don't know if you could, if my mouse transmitted fast enough for you to, <laughs> for that kind of illustration to work. But, but yeah, so, um, so, you know, so it's, it's possible to, to get the, um, the, transition from one stripe to another to, to work out a little better. I think this is probably with field curvature correction on. Um, so there's always going to be a little bit of a jump in, in Z as you move from one stripe to the other. If you turn the field curvature off, then, then you'd have less of a kind of a visible discontinuity from, from one stripe to another. Um, um, but, but again, you know, how good you get that, that, uh, that meshing to work kind of depends on you know, just how, how, how well you Kind of um, um, adjust some parameters in the software that that you know tell the mirrors where to go and stuff like that. Um, yeah, but anyway, but yeah, but that is yeah. Visually, you can see the that is the, the width of a scan line that the resonant mirror um, is able to produce. 
And in that regard, uh, could you uh, let us know uh, how was Mao's brain prepared? Like, was it flat cover sleep on the top or, or there was some kind of crystal skull that was yeah. formed? These, these are with the flat um, cover slip preps. Um, I think, you know, there is some amount of squishing. I'm, I'm really not an expert, but, but I, I definitely recall hearing that you, you do some amount of squishing the brain down, which I think was most important just for, for making it move less. I, I, I think there's, there's less motion correction that needs to be done then. Um, Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if anybody out there can, <laughs> is still there that can, that can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah, crystal skull is interesting. I mean, I think you know it would it would probably add a good amount of aberration. But but I yeah, I haven't heard of anybody using that with, with the mesoscope. Um, but I, you know, I would guess somebody has. Cool. Um, any more questions uh, from from anyone? Um, if not, we just probably um, add this. Uh, uh, yep. Go on, Alexander. We have just one more. No problem. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Uh, um, I think Junelli is also, also famous for uh, integrating so-called ultrasound tag lens for, for very fast Z-scanning. So mm -hmm. my question is, like, have you thought of, of this idea and where might be the obstacles there yeah. for Z-scanning? Yeah, I still think they're, they're pretty, you know, potentially useful devices. Um, I think now you can't buy them anymore, from what I heard. Uh, the company got bought by Mitutoyo, I think. Um, and they only make one now, which is kind of maybe used in, in some Mitutoyo, uh, Mitutoyo history. I think it was Mitutoyo. Um, um, you know, I, I don't think we knew about them when we designed this. We, you know, we might have thought about it. Um, you know, it, it is a very fast scan that you could, you know, add on top of that you know, will be the, the fast scan, you know, that you would add, you know, we'll put, you know it's faster than the resident mirror, right? is what I'm trying to say. Um, 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 so, um, it's, you know, it's, uh, it, it, so, you know, since we own the whole optical design, there's, there's theoretically, you know, a, a lot that we could, that we could add or adapt to this microscope. I think, uh, either a faster resonance scan mirror or a larger resonance scan mirror um, or, you know, something like the tag lens. I mean, you know, I, I think uh, I mean, since since the, the, the axial scanning is the first thing in our system and the tag lens would, would definitely work in a different way than the, the axial scanning we have now, uh, it, it might not really be possible. I mean, it, it would probably require redesigning almost all the rest of the optics to make it work with, with the microscope. Um, but, uh, but, you know, it's theoretically possible. Fantastic. Um, all right. Um, thank you all for um, um, being uh, available for the talk. And thanks, Dan, for giving the talk. I know it's been a little bit uh, bumpy, but I think overall, I, I personally did like the front bit, the um, the explanation of um, uh, scanning optics, uh, particularly, and thanks for your time for preparing the talk, um, and thanks everyone for 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 staying. And um, great, um, thank you. Bye. Thank you. It was great to to hear all the details about the mesoscope. It's absolutely something, absolutely something many groups are thinking about in neuroscience. Absolutely. Right. Thank you. See you. Yep. Thanks for thanks for attending.